Our guest in this first segment is Senator Shelley Moore Capito. <laughs> Senator Capito, good morning to you. Good morning. How are you all? We're well, great. Uh, great. Great to have you with us here this morning. We've got some big broadband news. Huge broadband news. Uh, over $1.2 billion coming to the state as a result of the infrastructure package, and we need it. And I think the assurances that that last house is going to get connected uh, are going to be are going to come true. And I, I think it's just fantastic for our state. And I uh, can't wait to see it uh, result in a lot of people, more people getting connected, either if they're unserved or underserved. President Biden yesterday said by 2030 he wants every house connected to broadband Internet. Is this part of that package from what he was talking about yesterday or is this a preceding package? No, this is that same package, and uh, I, I would say that 2030. I hope that's the out years. I mean, I hope this is a lot, uh, a lot sooner than that. Uh, we know that West Virginia has some high cost areas and areas that have not been reached, and uh, those are going to take a little bit longer and be more expensive. Which I think is why we were uh, one of the states that, that got some of the uh, uh, one of the top states over a billion dollars because we still have over. 271,000 people that are not connected or are underserved. So practically, how will this work? Is this being contracted yeah. out to specific companies? Th what this does is uh, it's it's through a program that's an existing program called the BEAD program, which is the Broadband e Equity Access and Development Program. And that's at the Department of Commerce. It's going to come to the state of West Virginia through our probably broadband council. We are there now. Uh, and they do great work, and this is a, a, a huge effort through the development office. And what they do is, uh, what they're going to do is have a deployment plan. So the money doesn't just come and then you deploy. You have to have the plan okayed and, uh, uh, you know, have the oversight on it to make sure it's going to achieve what it needs to achieve. And then it will come to the state, and that money will go to Internet service providers who have bid or who have applied for those uh, for those funds to be able to connect those last sections or, and those big sections that are still left unserved. Do we know about what percentage of West Virginia right now is not served by broadband Internet? You know, I, th that's a good question because percentage-wise, it's 271,000 uh, households, but I don't know what our real – I know we have one point, uh, approximately 1.8 million people – so I would say we're probably up around the 25 to 30 percent unserved, and uh, that's rather high. And we know we've been talking about it for a long time, and, and we've gotten a lot of action lately. But this, this is uh, – in asking – one time when I was first in asking this question, what is holding us up? And, and the thing that always came back to me was time and money. Well, you know what? We've got the money now. And it's time to shorten the time and move forward. And I think that's what we're going to be able to do. We're not going to waste this money. We wasted the money in 2010 with poor oversight. People didn't know what they were doing. We're not going to do that again. Uh, and, and we're going to make sure that this uh, program is successful and does serve that last, that last house, that last business, uh, because it's essential now. It's not just an option. It's essential. Well, oh, go ahead, Bill. No, um, morning, Senator. Yeah. Um, so hey, question for you. When when do you uh -huh. visualize this actually hitting the ground and people will be able to see this made available for them? You know, I would say in the next several months. Uh, you know, because we had such a bad experience in 2010, West Virginia is really further ahead here. Uh, through several governors, uh, and particularly Governor Justice, has created a broadband enhancement council that – it, are very knowledgeable. We've been developing our own maps, which the, the, the accuracy of the maps is really critical because you don't want to over-serve an area and over-build, but you don't want to leave people out when you have an opportunity like this. So we've gone granular to every single household, uh, every single uh, location, and, and that's significantly different than it was before. So we have an, an expert uh, council. We also have somebody from the Department of Commerce that is specifically targeted to helping West Virginia develop the best uh, deployment plan. And so I would say probably things will begin to roll maybe by early fall. Matt Harvey. Good morning, Senator Capito. Uh, morning. I, I want to congratulate you. I know that broadband expansion in West Virginia 
has been a pro- high priority for you. So um, looks like we're you're going to make some significant progress, and we appreciate that in West Virginia. A um, couple questions: What if what if you can run broadband to some of these hollers in southern West Virginia, but mm-hmm. th- they can't afford the service? Yeah, that's a good question. That is a really good question. So uh, during the COVID experience. And uh, we, we created a program called, uh, and I, I think it's a, a affordability program. It's a, it's a, it requires every Internet service provider to create a program that meets minimum standards uh, and, uh, and charge and for $30 a month. And uh, that's, uh, that would be the charge. So anybody who would be eligible for this will have to have an affordability program. The government does have, and we did create, a pot of money to help subsidize people who could not afford the $30 a month. So there is some available funds for those people that would fall into the category you're talking about. Uh, You know, we need better oversight on that program, quite frankly, because I think it's a little far flung right now, uh, seeing how we we reacted during COVID. So we want to make sure it's going to that, that particular house. The other thing is, as time goes on, these are not, um, these are not, uh, this connectivity is not going to be felt in a household budget as an option or as a fluff. This is going to be necessary for education, healthcare, working, all the kinds of things that really we know, but was really heightened during the COVID experience. I kind of want to jump on a comment that Matt just made. You know, sure. the, the, um, the getting affordability for these um, for the broadband, like most cable companies or internet companies. They, they target you, they get get in your door, they get you a dollar amount that it's really attractive that you can afford. But then after one year or two years, the price just keeps on escalating higher and higher. You, you have the internet, you need to have it for your job, for education, as you just said, Senator. But there seems to be very little oversight or restrictions on these companies from charging astronomical amounts as time goes on. It just keeps getting higher and higher each month that you have to pay for this. So is there any kind of regulations or oversight that can be provided that keep these companies from doing this? I think that I think the oversight that's provided in this program will have a handle on that. But I can tell you that exact scenario has happened to me uh, over time. Uh, and it's so frustrating. And by the time you call and find out why are you raising my bill $10 a month or whatever it is, uh, you know, their, their explanation is, well, we don't really have to tell you it's written into the contract, but, you know, nothing's changed. It's not like you got better service or, or I mean, I'm with you. That is very, very frustrating. It's bad consumer protection in my book. So I think that uh, if it's not already needs to be a part of this, uh, I'm sure there will be tighter, tighter rails on the providers because actually what they're getting here is, the money to deploy, to, to dig through those mountains that we have, to lay the fiber, uh, that, that's the costly part of the delivery of the service for them. So they shouldn't be able to then keep exponentially raising your prices without any change in service. Are we so af- I'll have a better answer for that as we move through this. Are we effectively maybe moving broadband into the utility category, Senator Capito? Well, I think we are as a service. I don't think we are uh, as uh, in terms of control. Uh, that's been a big debate in front of Congress because uh, uh, we have not treated Internet service as a utility. But I think for all practical aspects of your life, it is at a basic utility. I mean, I, I think about, you know, I'm sitting here in my home. Uh, and I, I think about what would I do if I didn't have the availability of it. It's almost it's almost hard to imagine what it was like before if you're making travel arrangements or FaceTiming with your grandchildren or, or reading or doing your, doing your work. And, and so I do, I do think it's a, a, a necessity now that maybe 10 years ago we didn't see. Yeah, I think we've moved to the point where with television, for instance, how many people are using cable any longer? So many people have right. cut the cord. You get your TV signal through the Internet. Uh, emergency alert systems work through your television to warn you of storms, right. national disasters. If your internet is down, 
What's your warning system? Your radio is not going to turn on on its own. And how many people have a radio in their house any longer anyway? Mm -hmm. Maybe you get even your radio through your phone these days. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have any access to the Internet as a, as a, as a utility, uh, boy, I'll tell you, functioning becomes even more challenging in stressful times. Yeah, I mean, it, it is it is amazing all the different ways. And I know a lot of people are cutting the cord and watching what they want. I think that's changing the way we're getting our news. It's changing the way we're uh, – uh, it's certainly changing the way the entertainment business is delivering mm -hmm. uh, product, and and so I think it's, it's it's sort of an interesting time to see where we're going to end up here. Well, this is great. The, the funds that are coming in. Uh, do you have any idea who, this amount, this 1.2 billion? Who is in charge of estimating what the funds, the money would be that would it take to to get the rest of the state connected, Senator? And do we have okay. enough labor to complete the task? Yeah, there was a was a forty two billion dollar pot of money in the infrastructure bill, and that was part of what I worked on, and and certainly wanted to make sure that this was part of an infrastructure package. And then what what we, what they did was they put the maps out, and they said, okay, West Virginia, these you have this many uh, households that we show already had service that would not qualify for this money because this money is targeted specifically because this is what we knew uh, have we've gone we've gone far afield from before, to the unserved and underserved. And so um, what happened was then you could challenge the maps. You could say, well, wait a minute. This shows my house is served, but in reality it's not. And so you could go to the FCC, put your address into a, into a mapping system that showed that you were not served, and then your name, you know, your location is added back in. And so we did that. Uh, over 110,000 West Virginians uh, disputed – Actually, 120,000 West Virginians disputed, along with the people at the Broadband Council, because they'd already done the mapping. And uh, 86,000 of those unserved locations were added back in. So that gave us our total number of over around 271,000, I think it is. Then they, I think they just uh, did it. It's a formula. And they just did it per, per head or however many people you have left unserved. And that left West Virginia, because we knew we, we were at the top of the unserved list. Is we were one of 19 states that got over a billion dollars, and you know, for a small state, uh, it's it, it's going to make huge differences. Senator, um, thinking about Starlink, mm -hmm. is that uh, they have the ability to get internet to places that are without running a lot of infrastructure? Is is that a potential? option under this plan or is broadband yes. with the fiber different than what they can beam through space no this is uh this program uh to my understanding and, and i think is agnostic as to the technology so if it's if it's satellite uh if it's uh fixed you know cabling if it's uh fixed wireless uh i i, I think it'll be a combination uh, I do think that and my experience has been that in certain areas of West Virginia, the satellite uh, service is more difficult. You can imagine with some of this, our steeper uh, terrains, it's, it's hard to carry the signal consistently. And, uh, and so, you know, I did this program through my, through my website at the Senate to ask people to tell me your story about your Internet connection. And I can tell you, people don't write – uh, to their senator to tell them everything's going really well. <laughs> and, so, and so we had like 1,100 people that wrote about all the problems that they'd have, whether it was we don't have enough service to carry my son doing their homework and me working. Uh, I have to buy two satellite providers because one goes out. I need, I need redundancy. Uh, I don't have it. My neighbor has it. I mean, it was all over the place. Uh, really interesting. Uh, no customer service was a big complaint. And so anyway, um, uh, I, I think it's in terms of getting back to your original question, in terms of uh, what the technology is, it's, it's basically agnostic to the technology. And this is where the Broadband Council, w looking with the Department of Commerce, will be able to determine what's appropriate for certain areas. You start. You have a follow up there, man. Well, no, I, I've just ha had a kind of an off question about how this, if like the Green Bank area where they have the radio quiet zone, is this right? Does does it, did those numbers kind of skew West Virginia as far as the underserved or unserved? You know, I I, I think that uh, in the Green Bank area, there's probably areas there that are still going to be um, dark, so to speak, because of the interference with the signals. And uh, there may be some other areas in the state that have uh, 
quiet zones that uh, for uh, other purposes, maybe Department of Defense kinds of things. Uh, and so I think some of those areas, I think probably the people that live in those areas are well aware of uh, the restrictions that they might have. So I don't think they're in these numbers. Uh, I don't think they would be considered unserved if they couldn't properly be served. You started working on this in September of 2018. I was reviewing the timeline for all of this, so nearly five years uh, later. Is, is that a, uh, a typical timeline for getting a major piece of legislation through like this, Senator? Well, it's a, it's a, the, the infrastructure bill in and of itself, the, some of the major portions of it, uh, broadband is part of that, but the road and the water portions, they're typically five-year bills. And so it takes a while to draw them together. There are obviously enormous amounts of dollars. Uh, there's new technologies to look at. Um, and then there's oversight that you want to see what's working, what isn't working, what needs to, you know, move forward. You know, five years is a long time, but in between that time, you know, we were sitting at our homes for two, two years. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I was still going into the Senate, but everything was sort of at a halt in terms of, uh, we were more focused on how we're going to cope with the crisis at hand. Uh, and, and hopefully this won't take five years to deploy, but we want to do it carefully because we know we've squandered money here before. We saw during COVID a big influx of dollars. Where does it all go? Where's the waste, waste fraud and abuse? We want to guard against that, um, heavily guard against that, because this is a, an opportunity we don't want to miss. So do we, um, do we have a priority areas that are going to be served first with this rollout of these infrastructure you know, dollars? I, I think that's probably going to be in the deployment plan that the broadband council puts together. Uh, I would imagine that uh, they'll probably, they've probably already got it pretty much formulated because they've been looking at this for a long time. But, you know, uh, I think probably the farther out places are going to be the harder to reach. I don't know that those are going to be the first priority. Um, I can tell you in the panhandle, uh, I've got a friend who lives close to Shepherd, and she hasn't had service for many years. And so, you know, it seems to me those areas are going to be the easy ones to get uh, in terms of uh, deploying the service. Yeah. And, and so I would imagine the easy ones are going to go, go the quickest and the, and, the, and the harder ones are going to be at the end. But, you know, it'd probably be a combination. Well, I think with um... – Berkeley County, I know, being the fastest growing county in the state and and um, has been for a large amount of time, um, we don't have a adequate service providers just here. Even if you're in an area that, that provide, you have broadband that's provided to you, um, there's so many people moving into our area that the service is not capable, it's similar to the roads. Our roads aren't uh, adequate to handle all the influx of traffic coming in. So, um, it's it's difficult to have providers that's going to provide adequate broadband service to your homes as well. So as we have people continually to move in our county, um, one of the popular parts of jobs are working satellite and working from home. So that's a that's a priority to have that have that internet service available. So and there's a lot of areas in Berkeley County that out out in the country that people want to move to because they don't want to necessarily live in an area that. Uh, uh, they have all the restrictions and everything. So it's going to be really critical to have that provided to our county. Well, I think obviously for, for the growth uh, aspects of being able to work from home, being able to do your homework uh, online, uh, and then the, for the businesses moving into Berkeley County, you know, these some of these are massive businesses that rely a lot on, uh, on you know, technology that requires connectivity. And so you're right. Uh, you would, but the part of the problem has been lack of uh, competition. And I think this program will bring that competition uh, because the affordability of that company to be able, you know, hasn't been economical maybe for them to spread their wings. I think the more people you get in there, the more competition, the better it's going to be. And so Berkeley County, I'm sure. Uh, will be one of the ones that probably get served quickest and also broadest because of the uh, population growth. Just tuning in, uh, $1.2 billion in funds coming to West Virginia. Thank you, Senator Capito, for that, for uh, finishing up wiring the state, so to speak, with broadband Internet. Matt Harvey, you were about to say. Oh, I was going to ask you, Senator, um, I know previously when there was some bids out for broadband expansion in West Virginia, there was some concerns about a particular company, and I think uh, Frontier. 
which we've ha- has had a different uh, checkered past in West Virginia. Have have and I think you've expressed your concerns about that previously. Um, they they did receive the bids on those expansions. Has there been any? Um, have you had occasion to follow up with how they're doing and if they've improved their service? Well, you know, I've been a big critic of Frontier, and uh, I was uh, disappointed with what happened in 2010 with Frontier. And uh, uh, to be quite honest, their customer service complaints coming into our office were very, very frequent. And just anecdotally talking to people, the service does not did not match what 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 it should have been. But I will say this: that, that being a heavy critic of them, of late. They have been expanding. They are uh, they are de- delivering more service, and uh, and we get fewer complaints. So I think they've had a bit of a wake up call as they should have, and they are uh, paying better attention. But as people are listening here today, uh, if you find that's a false statement, or if you if you have a, a true statement, you want to register, please call my office or you know uh, write me a short email to tell me because. If, uh, you know, it's a major provider in our state, there hasn't been as much competition to Frontier, which makes you, you know, not deliver. Uh, I think it's, they've been able to sort of skate, and they're not going to be able to do that anymore, and they realize it. And I think they've been upping their service, and they've been much more responsive. So for somebody who's been a heavy critic of them, I'll have to say it looks like they're getting a bit better. So thank you for that, Frontier. Senator Capito, thank you so much for your time this morning. We appreciate you covering out the entire half hour for us. Of course. Thanks. And I hope you guys have a good a good day. You too. Thanks so much for being with us. Mm-hmm.